Welcome in to the backcourt episode number two. Nets fans, you are now with one of your hosts, Lucas Kaplan. I write for Nets Daily, been covering the Nets for a little minute now. And my other host, someone you should know if you know anything about Nets basketball, Sarah Kustak. Sarah, how are we doing? I'm fantastic. Fantastic. Good start to this Brooklyn Nets season. So uh, no complaints from my end. I was going to say, it is uh, quite the day to record after their home opener, a very convincing win against the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, before that, a loss to the Atlanta Hawks to open the season that went down to the wire and a loss in Orlando um, that didn't quite go down to the wire, but was a competitive game for three and a half quarters. So, you know, we're in the swing of things. You've been at all three games. How does it feel to be back? It feels, it's always incredible to be back. I think anytime this this start of the NBA season, as we mentioned earlier, there's a freshness, there's a newness, there's a curiosity of really what all the teams in the league are going to look like. But in particular, as we're talking about the Nets, I think watching training camp, experiencing what, whether it was the lineups, the roster, this new era under Jordy Fernandez and the coaching staff, um, how it would translate when it came to real games and other opponents. And by all accounts, I'm trying to remember a time where a coach, a coaching staff has said, this is this is what we aspire our identity to be. This is the foundation we want to lay. And quite frankly, so quickly, you see it visibly in front of you and how a team is playing. And it was a tremendous home opening win. It's always amazing to get a win. Um, but to me, the process of the game in Atlanta, the game in Orlando, a lot of those tenets of what they're looking to do, you, you saw it on display. And I think that, to me, was the most impressive part of this early part of the season. Yeah, I mean, it's easy for every coaching staff to come in and say, you know, we want to do this. And obviously, everybody wants to play fast and shoot threes and be physical. But when it's, you know, a, a totally, I guess, new era this new beginning that the Nets are in, um, where this is really the the sort of focal point of the year, of the season, is establishing this identity. And like you see it, and you see the bench going crazy, and you see the physicality, and it's not contrived. It really feels genuine. I think both of us being around the team, I guess, can speak to what I said, you know, the genuine nature of like, man, these guys are really playing hard and they're playing for one another. Um, you were at the two road games, which is also when you're on the road, it's a more close knit environment in a sense, because, you know, you're all you got. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to like that, you know, before we get to the on court, you know, X's and O's stuff, the vibes around this team, just from what you've seen in the early going. Hi, mm -hmm. uh, very, very high in the sense of you can tell they enjoy one another enjoy playing for one another and i think by all accounts and we've touched on this a little bit in episode one i really think it's a beautiful mix of players with veteran experience and mm -hmm. some that are young and looking to prove themselves in the league and i i think that mix has allowed for a great template of growth of learning, of everyone kind of immersing themselves in, in what this may become and taking a little bit of ownership in it. And so on the road, yeah, it was it was great to see. It was great to watch. And to your point, we see things on the court, but even off the court and um, just how the players are interacting with one another and, and enjoying the process. And I think uh, the vision has been very clearly laid out of what this is. And Jordy Fernandez has used the word building quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone understands that, but they also are excited about what that means um, because there's a lot of space to grow. And I think for any player to have that type of leeway uh, is something that you can see how invested they are this early on in doing so collectively. Yeah. And like it starts with the veterans. The starting lineup are not only veterans, but like veterans that have been in trade rumors. And yet when they pick up full court, they're forcing <laughs> turnovers and deflections. Like it's not token pressure, like a chore, like, oh, I guess we got to do it. Like they're forcing turnovers. You mentioned it to me earlier, like against Orlando, 
who is a team with that reputation, the refs will allow a little more contact. They've earned it. You were like, like, yo, like, what, are they going to like call some fouls? Like, this is this is pretty crazy, and it's game number two. And what I loved about that, Lucas, was that you you knew that coming in. Uh, yeah. You said it. The Orlando Magic, that is a part of their DNA and how they play, um, both with who they have personnel-wise individually, but also mm-hmm. collectively. The Nets met that the moment the tip started. And yeah. It started. There there wasn't a sense of, oh, man, we got we got knocked in the mouth. Now we need to respond. There was there was an immediate back and forth. Uh, and it was a brutal game. And that's that's what you often see. I mean, that's that's how the Magic want to play. Um, but the Nets were right there with it in them. And, you know, the unfortunate, you know, trips to the foul line of the Atlanta game, I think obviously Jordy mm-hmm. Fernandez talking to, to his team about balancing that and trying to walk the line of being incredibly physical and being willing to hit and being willing to play with force. But also, how do you do that where you're not sending a team to the line 40 some odd times or, you mm-hmm. know, just making that a, a great disadvantage? And the Orlando game, it was. And in many cases, it got a little ugly, but that was what I loved to see was it It was from both sides. And Brooklyn was all in on being a part of that in a way that was beneficial and positive for, I think, what you want to see out of that group. And you said it wasn't, it wasn't the same as the Atlanta game where it came down to the end. However, there was a feel even going into that fourth quarter of this is an Orlando team that had continuity, they got mm-hmm. everyone back, adding the piece of KCP, and they feel like they've gotten even better from the postseason that they played in last year. And the, the Nets were right there with them, uh, yeah. competing in a way that I think was really impressive to see early on. And they didn't lose because of the physicality. They really lost because they some X's and O's like couldn't generate open shots. Orlando ended up shooting 50% from three. Like they made every three in the second half, obviously a lot to work on, but it certainly was not because they didn't meet the moment in terms of playing the way Jordy wants them to play spiritually. And kind of something I realized is that I was, you know, there were some fouls that were avoidable, like holding screeners, whatever, you know, the reach ins, but it is, I, I, what's kind of clicking for me is that it's easier to tune it down than to try to bring the level up. So I think even when we were talking to Jordy after those th- each of the first three games, he's like, yeah, some of those are correctable. We're going to talk. You know, you got to guard with your chest and not reach. But he was pleased overall that we were even talking about that because, you know, it's easier to, oh, man, I'm going to forget who said it. But it's easier to tame a lion than to try to get a cat to roar. I'm glad, uh, that, I'm glad that's not our trivia question because I. It's not. It's I, not. I wouldn't even. I, it's not even on the tip of my tongue. It's an old coach. Ah, man, that's gonna bother me. Um, but, but sorry to. But but to that point though, you're spot. Yeah. On. And I think you know. I think that's that's the fun part about that. And training camp, um, you know, watching. I got to sit there and and watch it day to day and watch the practice of what they were they were going at one another. So mm-hmm. I. Hope think the real back of that of just this is how you're playing each and every day okay let's recalibrate um for how we need to now play here when there's officiating and when it's uh, regular season games yeah not to go too quote heavy too early but Zaire right before the first regular or that stretch where they had three preseason games in a week laughed and was like yeah like we're ready to beat up on somebody else and we've seen that so far um first I guess, named segment we got going on. Brooklyn's Finest. Going to be a recurring segment. We just look at maybe maybe not the MVP of the week per se, but just someone that played really fine, really impressed us. Uh, A little homage to DJ Clark Kent, uh, who passed away earlier this month. Legendary Brooklyn DJ um, contributed to the Jay-Z and Biggie song Brooklyn's Finest. It just felt fitting. So, net of the week, essentially, who impressed you? the most who really stood out to you over these last three games there's a handful Mm -hmm. um and i know we're going to get to cam thomas later in the show so i don't know if he's your guy but clearly the numbers have proven um that he he certainly opened up eyes in an even greater way than we expected but i'm going to go actually with a different cam and cam johnson Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I think a lot of play. you can go down the list of players that I think have been steady and impressive and for a variety of reasons, Dennis Schroeder, what he's done, Nick Claxton, this limited times. Um, but Cam Johnson's a player. You mentioned it. Like, he has been a topic of trade rumors. He has been a player that understands his role on this team. Um, but I love what he's been able to do in terms of being a bit of a glue guy and doing mm-hmm. so on the defensive side in ways that, yeah, he's expected to knock down three-point shots, and he's done that. But to me, there's been nuances of the game and small parts of the game that has allowed this team to really flourish on both ends. And even his willingness to the point of picking up full court, how he's he's communicated on the defensive side, what he's done in terms of pick and roll coverage, um, always being in the right place, the rebounding aspect of it. And I think the entirety of this team, um, you know, you would ask this question or had sent this earlier, like Zaire Williams popped in my head of just mm-hmm. his insane activity. Um, but how many how many tip outs that Brooklyn has had that has allowed them second possession? But Cam Johnson to me has just opened my eyes in a different way. Of I love what I'm seeing out of him early. He seems confident. He seems comfortable. These are all, all things that have been characteristic of how he's played. But I think he has been a pivotal part of when we talk about this identity creation and what Jordy Fernandez wants out of this group. I think he's done a lot of maybe not quite so visible, noticeable things that jump out at you, but have allowed the functionality of this group to be at the level that it is. Definitely. Averaging, you know, it's a little early for averages, obviously, but he is averaging what would be a career high in shots. So he's been aggressive. Some of the threes aren't falling yet, but again, it's been literally three games. And yesterday against Milwaukee, we were recording this on Monday. um, He was... I thought awesome from start to finish. I, I did too. Like that. I mean, there was just so many little things. Mm-hmm. There was the right places defensively, or like I said, all of that stuff. Um, it, it wasn't maybe just if you're sitting watching the game, you're focused on some of the other players or some of the other things that happened. Right. There, there was little parts of yesterday that I'm like, he, he made game winning plays um, in moments that mattered. Yeah. The one that really, there was one that shut the door where the Nets had given up a couple layups on drives and then that little lay down pass to like a guy on the block goes up for a layup dame drives the lane cam johnson rotates over jumps and contests with one hand and sticks his other hand out gets a deflection gets a steal it's like 12 points the lead or like 14 and milwaukee's making one last push and there's it's like okay let's slow it down that's kind of the closing of the door. And I thought it was fitting that he made that play on defense on something they, they, you know, got maybe burned by like a couple times. And he was the one to say, you know, I'm going to make a good play right here and do what we need to do. So I thought that was awesome from him. Um, I, you mentioned him. I will go with Zaire Williams. Uh, How did I know that? I feel like I left him for you because I, I knew this is where we we're headed in a great way to be fair you mentioned like four or five names so you had a good <laughs> like to be fair you mentioned every guy that played but so however <laughs> that was half the rotation however you know i think you i think the way you said it you knew where i was going so i'll give you half credit why do you th- why do you think i'm gonna say i'm like what have you seen and i'm sure i'll agree with it well, I would start with the the activity defensively. I mean, he literally mm-hmm. is yeah. everywhere, whether it's on the glass, O glass, D glass, pressuring guys everywhere up the floor. And we're not just talking about – I mean, it, it could be off a of make, a miss, and he's mm-hmm. he's just ball hawking in so many different ways, covers so much ground. Um, but the three-point shooting, and again, small sample size, but that's always been his time in Memphis. And obviously watching him in the early part of his career, that's always been the question mark. Um, so I'm curious where you, but those are the two things that if he's knocking down some open looking threes or some that were somewhat contested in a consistent rate, that to me changes the entire dynamic of how you use him. Um, because more often it's, it's okay. That's, that's icing on the cake if he can hit those threes, but it does matter given the other players that now you could, okay, yeah. Put him alongside, be out there with class and be out there with some and be out there with players that it still adds an element of spacing if he can do those type of things. And small sample size, but a, a very solid look for three games in with how comfortable he's been taking those shots. 
No, I love it. And I love that you mentioned his lineup sort of pairings um, because the lineup that really won a lot, their minutes in a big way twice yesterday was uh, Zaire, Noah Clowney, and Nick Claxton. And then in the second half, they played with Dennis and Cam, who were just going off, Cam Thomas, that is. But, you know, I asked Jordy about that post game, those three. And Zaire, when he's like the third biggest, third longest guy on the court, you know, because Memphis, they'd go a little small that he'd be like the power forward to say that. But when he's the third biggest guy and he's flying around, you know, Jordy said, you know, we talk about how small we've been and how we have to fight. But like right now you see those three guys on the court and you're like, wow, there's no room. They're flying around yeah. and their effort has been amazing. And he and Noah have been taking and making enough shots to keep the defense honest to sort of insulate Clax with what he needs. And man, every time Zaire's been on the court, he's been doing good things. And the one thing that I think, you know, I talked to some Memphis people preseason, he might not be the most explosive finisher at the rim, but like when he puts the ball on the floor, he really does want to make the right pass. Like he is a very willing drive and kick guy. It's just this overwhelming energy of like he is trying very hard, but not in a reckless way. He's just trying very hard to make the right play. And I've already seen, you know, a lot of Nets fans be like, hold on, like, I, I kind of like this guy. And I think it's very easy to understand why. You nailed it. And thank you. That was so well put before we move on. It, it's mm. not a frenetic energy and it's not out of control. Right. And I think you see some players that are super athletic or, um, you know, just really active that sometimes they seem like they're not fully in control. Um, and he does not feel that way. He just feels like he's got length and he's got an ability um, to really mm -hmm. for a lot of people on that defensive end. And it really works because I will say, backtracking just a little, it is very funny that, and I don't know if you felt this way, that the Nets do the most physically taxing thing at all times. So like, for example... If there's a mismatch, if there's a switch and they're guarding the post, they make the small guy front the post with backline help. If there's a pick and roll on one side, they make everybody come over across the rim. It's like weak side help is on the other side of the court and then they have to scramble out of it. And it is like, I mean this as a compliment. It is funny that Jordy has said they're going to play very hard and then he's like, okay, our scheme is like whatever the most physically taxing thing is, that's what we're doing at all times. You're picking up full court and like we're doing this. But when you have guys like Zaire, it becomes very fun to watch. And so he in, in, in one way is like very, I guess, emblematic of my takeaways from three games. One, one more thing I'll say on that, and that's what I'm curious for us and, and all Nets fans to continue watching. I am... I really, I don't know if surprised is the right word because it's mm -hmm. more impressed. Um, but often when you have a new head coach, a new group of players, it takes a while to like truly figure out your scheme or your defensive scheme, the communication. Um, you know, breakdowns can happen just because you're thinking and it takes right. the rotations and the quickness of the rotations when they are, to your point, mm -hmm. when they're switching or they're blitzing, they're trapping, they're doing this at different parts. And the next man away, just the awareness, even with a lot of like getting some strips or some deflections, and then you got the next guy yeah. right there to pick it up and get going. That doesn't always, to me, happen this quickly in forming and coming together um, where there feels like there's a really true understanding, regardless who's on the floor, um, in terms of the rotation players that have played. And so that's why, I mean, you look at what they're doing defensively, but I'm like, man, they 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 know exactly where to be. And they're, it's, it's one thing to play hard. And it's one thing to execute and try and, you know, play well on the ball, but the off the ball activity, mm. and off the ball rotations, like you give, you got to give a lot of credit um, to the coaching staff and to these players though, for how quickly they have adapted to that and are really executing it. Absolutely. That yesterday, that's honestly why they won the game in, in against Milwaukee. Uh, that if I had to pick one reason uh, last week, we anticipated what the stat sheets might look like. I said, you know, if you're going to look at one stat, like a bellwether for how this team's competing, playing, what would you look at? You, What would we look at? You you won that round because I'll tell you why. You said turnovers. This is my competition. Lucas, we're, we're partners. Yeah, but you did. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm let's too. just say you were slightly more right then. Because turnovers was yours. You said that's what we're going to be looking at, and that's how they're going to be playing. Two games, they've lost the turnover battle. They've lost the game. They won the turnover battle against Milwaukee, and they won the game. And I, we could probably agree that was their most complete effort. So on that front, what have you been seeing? I just, it's, it goes back to all the things we're talking about defensively, which quite frankly, Lucas, like you've mm. been covering the scene for a long time. I have, this is not an aspect of how we've seen this team play, no matter no. who has asked, no matter what coaches have asked these players of, we want to force more turnover. Every team wants to force more turnovers. Turnovers, um, They are actually doing it. And they were doing it. Um, because all things that we talk, just talked about, you can carry that over of the rotations, the ball pressure, getting in passing lanes, everyone having awareness of what's happening on the floor, the engagement. And so it's simply that. And I also think they've, I, I was curious to see in, in particular the Milwaukee game. Um, and Jordy Fernandez talked about this in his pregame press conference, the difference between the first half defense and the second half defense. And there can be a lot of factors, fatigue being one of what you're asking of guys, but also just teams making adjustments. Exactly. And so there's not a ton of film on how Jordy Fernandez necessarily is going to be a head coach of this particular personnel and crew. So mm. these first couple games, other coaching staff, like maybe catches a team off guard that, oh man, they're picking up full court. You don't see that often. Um, just throughout the courses of, of games with a lot of teams, what they're doing on the defensive side and, okay, we kind of figure this out a little bit more, make some adjustments at half, and we can better handle what's happening at that end of the floor. And so I was curious to see, in particular, a team like Milwaukee with a Dame, Giannis, Brooke, the uh, list goes on, how would they look in the second half having a better feel? Like, okay, these, these nets hit us hard. Uh, we got punched in the mouth. Oh, how are we going to respond? Um, and it really it didn't matter because the Nets were still able to do those same, same type of things and bother them, irritate them on the defensive end. Uh, and it was all the things we talked about. And I also think, too, just taking care of the basketball themselves. Yeah. And that always hasn't been perfect. You can look at the numbers. Um, but I think the Nets have taken care of the basketball. I think by virtue of their shot selection, oftentimes team will get runouts if not just you're turning the ball over, but if your shot selection is poor, I think the Nets shot, shot selection overall has been quality. And I also think, too, the other caveat, and it's not like – look at what we keep talking about the offensive glass and some of those tip outs are keeping balls alive. Like the amount of, of production of points and that's got from points off turnovers and second yeah. points that margins makes a huge difference against a team like Milwaukee. Yeah. They took 17 more shots than that, that, Milwaukee. Yeah. Like uh, by the numbers, that's very difficult to beat a team. If yeah. you are getting that many extra offensive possessions or looks and they took more threes and they took more shots in the paint. So it was like a coach's dream in many respects. Um, my stat to watch for was uh, two-point shooting from yeah. the opponent. Like, you know, three-point shooting, Orlando is not a great shooting team. They got very hot, and obviously it's on the nets, but they shot 50%. I was like, okay, are we allowing easy looks at the basket, so on and so forth? Milwaukee actually shot above league average from two, but... This is where I said you won. It was the turnovers. Like, the Nets' interior defense was very good. And so you can't just look at that. That's not the full picture. Like, they got a lot of deflections, a lot of strips. And, you know, Giannis did his thing occasionally. Bobby Portis made a couple fadeaways. But their inside-the-arc defense was better than that would suggest. So just how have you felt about their ability to – and, like, I, we've obviously covered a lot of this – but – protect the rim and make it hard in the paint even though like they're not starting nick claxton they're pretty maybe not small they're longer than they are big if that right. makes sense and, and i think i'll say a couple things one mm -hmm. we saw this last season with dorian finney smith like he's very comfortable playing mm -hmm. um it, it position above his size and just it playing a little bit bigger given how he moves given his intelligence at the defensive end communication but i think it circles back to think about how many times, especially early in that game, but throughout the, that you had a collapse of, you had two, three Brooklyn guys around the basket yep. or with levels of meet, meeting at the rim or meeting at the basket, but there was a second guy there to help. 
And there were so many instances at the rim that Milwaukee will probably look back and feel like we, we missed a ton of bunnies or some layups or just shots we should make. But I do think it was that level of resistance um, that was the first part of it. No one was getting even to like on the perimeter. Sometimes guys get a really clear lane because they're you, you, you're forcing rotations mm-hmm. out yeah. because someone gets beat on the perimeter and then all of a sudden you're, you're put in a compromised position. So it leads to a foul or it leads to an easier look. We haven't seen a ton of that. Like we haven't seen a lot of that at all. And I think there is, that's a big part. I've mentioned this before watching training camp. Like they worked on verticality at the rim. They worked on leading with their chest. They worked on getting back in transition and those type of things. Um, this also circles back to if, if you can take care of the ball and if you can have some quality shot selection, you're going to have a better chance right. of playing in your half-court defense as opposed to running back and worrying about scrambling and transition defense. Um, but I, I do. I think just everyone has bought into that and bought into we use the board physicality so much, but it's been evident at all spots. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think there's just kind of that, that's kind of how they're all all playing and showing up. And, you know, whether it's Shooter or Cam Thomas or, you know, Jalen Wilson or whoever else that are, are not one of the bigger, longer players, right. like they still understand that yeah. they need to come through in that way. And they've done a nice job of it. They're fighting. I posted like maybe my favorite Camp Thomas defensive play in some time from the Atlanta game where, you know, somebody drives the lane on the other side and like throws the lob to Clint Capella and Thomas sinks down and like bats it away. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it, but it's, it's how many times did that happen where like mm-hmm. that, whether it's the low man coming through or whoever, they're, they're in the right spot. Cam that, Johnson had the steal and then he hit the, the three on the other end. Yeah. 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 The one it, thing it makes yeah. it tough. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you're good. The one thing I would tell Nets fans to like look for as like a, uh, as a signifier of that is like, even when teams get layups, think about how often you see a guy catch the ball on the perimeter and drive like all the way to the rim and finish versus how often that guy has to make another pass for the layup. And like, you're going to give up layups in the NBA. These guys are very good. However, that like, you don't see a lot of straight line. This is what you said. You don't see a lot of straight line drives to the basket. Keep in mind, you know, if you see that Jordy will not be happy, but we really haven't seen it. It's been a lot of, you have to make one more pass and that gives us another chance to like, get our hands on the ball, get in position, whatnot. Um, I think that is, uh, I think we've about covered the defense. Man, it's been a good start. We're saying a lot of positives. We are. We are, which is a good thing, especially on that end of the floor. Definitely. So the next segment is called The Next Net. And going back to our first episode, we talked about Sean Mark saying this in his introductory remarks this year. This season is about finding the next nets. Like, who do we want to build with? You said Jordy uses the word build a lot. Who do we want to build with? So who is someone for this upcoming week? Before we talk again, they got it. They're going to play five games. So we're going to get a, we're going to have a lot to talk about next week. Who is someone, you know, this isn't inherently positive or negative, but who is someone based on this last week that you're like, okay, let me see. Like, like, you know. I'm Sean Marks. I'm whoever. Like, I'm building this team. Like, I want to see what you can bring. I'm really excited to evaluate your next week. Who's that for you? Noah Clowney. Nice. Uh, For a variety of reasons. One, I think we've seen a ton of positive out of him. We saw him have a rookie year where he spent the good majority of in the Long Island with the Long Island Nets and, and did some really special things and I think progress in a way that many would hope um, this season coming in, I think to the, to your point of us talking about lineups and lineup combinations, the, the concept of him potentially and with Dayron Sharp being out mm-hmm. a part of the trend and Watford still being out, but mm-hmm. is someone who could potentially play the five be Claxton's backup at the five, play the four, could he play some three. Um, he's obviously been taking a lot of three point shots. The three point shot looks good. Uh, I also would like to see more variation of how much he can get to the rim. Um, I think there was some some of those looks that I'm like, maybe maybe you could have found a better shot for a teammate. Maybe you yourself could find there's a balance to all of that. Mm-hmm. 
but the the intangibles are there the the timing i think we often see on the defensive side uh the rebounding aspect you know we see it whether it's with blocks whether it's his movement out on the perimeter uh switchability on the defensive side there's a lot of things about him that that you can see where the trajectory would keep going up 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 and up um but now this is like the first real run and stretch that we i think will get to see him play where he's consistently getting time in a part of the rotation in the nba with this team and so how does he continue to capitalize that and how does he continue to yeah, I guess on the offense, like benefit in a way that it is within the flow of the offense of how he's scoring or how he's looking for his shots. And um, I think we saw some flashes of it, but then I think you also see moments where you know that he's still whatever, 21 years old and still just in his second year. And and there is a lot more that you want to see from him. Um, but I'm, ju- I'm just really, my my level of curiosity and interest is super high in what this looks like in three weeks, Lucas, or once you get a full, like, let's go 15, 20 games. And how much has he taken steps? Has he taken steps? And has he continued to grow um, with these opportunities? I hate to fact check such a great, you know, depiction of how I feel about Noah Clowney. He's actually 20, not even 21 yet. See, look at that. There, there we go. There we you're go. You're trying to you're okay. trying to get him a fake ID. No, I'm not trying to. No, I'm not trying to add years to anyone. Mm, no, that's okay. No, I honest mistake. He's very young. He's younger than you think. I do agree. I want to see. It's funny because you can tell. Like they're like Noah, you got to shoot threes to be on the court, and he does. And he takes that advice so literally. It's awesome. I would like to see. Not like that. I'm faulting him, but you know, I think we both want to see him explore a little more of the closeout attacks because to me almost the bigger swing skill than the three-point shooting is like can he finish inside you know he has to get a little stronger he had a nice take yesterday but you know he's like six nine with long arms he's gonna have to be like a, a solid finisher inside i i'm gonna just for you love numbers but just to kind of put it in perspective and again i think we like to see it and it's great but for reference, against Milwaukee, he took eight three-point attempts, um, made three. One of those was a banker. Mm, yeah. um, but so that's off the bench. The only other players that took as many or more were Schroeder with eight, Camp Thomas with eight, yeah. and Camp Johnson with nine. And yeah. so just the the shot the shot distribution of where you want that to be may not be quite at that point. Mm. That was the most pure Hooper podcast segment ever because Sarah said, I know you like numbers. So she very politely called me a nerd. And no, then, I, and love, then, I, I love numbers too. I think and then as a shooter yourself, a reference. as a bona fide shooter, you had to like, you know, he did, he did bank one in. He like, you, you, you shoot the ball those, too well those, to like, let that slide. Those count though. Those count. It was great. He was three of eight. That's great. They count, I, but I knew you wanted to say it. So I respect We're trying that. to make sure all our listeners have our mm. have our our same frame of reference. It's true. It's true. No, I, I think we're on the same page, Noah. I really want to see him expand more. I like that they do brief nerd aside, they do a lot of roll rise action where Nick Claxton rolls and Clowney rises to the top of the key and gets to like decide what to do. And I, that's a spot where it's not just, oh, you're in the corner. You gotta right. like shoot the ball. So I like that. I can tell Jordy's trying to give him a little bit of decision making and like leeway and freedom to expand. So I think we're all on the right track with yeah. Noah. And, um, and I do. I think like think about him, Zaire. Like we had talked about the lineup, but him, Claxton, and Zaire on the floor together. But yeah, that defensive. I mean, there's the combinations that he can present with that addition of three point shooting, I think is is really exciting. So what does he do now mm-hmm. with this freedom and how does he continue to grow with that? And my next net is kind of similar who to who I picked last week before this podcast had a name. Um this segment had a name. Actually not similar. It's the same guy, Nick Claxton, because I thought yesterday was like he actually looked like Nick Claxton again. And that's not a diss. He just missed the whole preseason. So I get it. But also like they probably win that Atlanta game if Nick is like yeah. in regular season shape, like Onyeka Okongwu, who I love, probably doesn't have 28 points. Right. Nick probably plays more than like 14 minutes. 
Uh, but he looks like himself against Milwaukee. And it's the same thing I talked about last week where I'm really excited to get him a little bit more opportunity to like feel out the ball handling, the hub stuff, the passing. But also, he played a lot of different defensive coverages yesterday. He guarded Giannis. He, he guarded Bobby Portis for a little as like a roamer. He played at the level. He played in drop. That was like a Nick Claxton performance. And when he's playing real minutes and he looks like himself, you can see an avenue to like a pretty good defense. And he's like the most important part of it. So I'm really excited to see. They got five games this week. They got two back-to-backs. They're playing Jokic. They're playing d- different, but they're playing Zach Eady. It's a big week for him. I love I love. He was – if it was not Noah, he was the other guy that I was thinking mm-hmm. of. So I'm so glad you said that. And to that point about he's going to have more freedom on both ends, I think, as time goes on and the more he gets back to his, his regular – workload and minute load um and also you like how many times has Jordy Fernandez already said that he believes he can be a defensive player of the year so he is going to task him with a lot and give him a lot of responsibility and I think Nick has shown that he he embraces that and he relishes in that and I think he's ready for that Mm -hmm. I like that Jordy said yesterday he should be a defensive player of the year I was like it's a little early to do awards stuff however I I like where your head is at. I think at. he said that in the preseason. I he think did. he said that during media day. Yeah. He did. You never, never too early to appeal to voters. <laughs> um, speaking of someone who will be getting votes for something or other, whatever, Cam Thomas, like, he actually, like, might lead the league in scoring. Like, he really might do it. I don't want, I know it's three games and I just climb, like, yeah, you're, you're just, you're clowning people on, on uh, defensive player of the year awards and now you're already. Picking us, who, who's going to lead the league in scoring? No, but I like, like he, I like it. But like, bro, he he really might yeah. because I like wasn't even. I was a little. I'm more on the side of like, nah, he'll probably like average, you know, and this might happen, whatever. But lower mid twenties, and like he'll see two on the ball, and he'll have to pass and yada yada and whatnot. And I'm like, he wasn't even really like chucking. Those first, you know, like Atlanta, Milwaukee, and he's like getting 30. And he, there's like, I was like, oh my God, he really might average 30 this year. Well, here's the thing too. If you look at the difference of numbers in the first half and the second half, mm-hmm. I feel like he's let the game come to him. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons to be impressed with him. We know that he is a bona fide scorer. But there's a difference, and, and we saw this last year too, so I'm not going to act like there hasn't been a steady progression. Right. Of him doing it within the flow and the context of the offense and understanding. And don't be mistaken, if, if he starts to cook, like he's going to look for but there's a quickness of how he's either deciding to shoot, deciding to score, or he gets off the ball. And the quickness of the ball movement and the pace that's taken place, the tempo in the half court, he's been a big part of that. And he will have gravity. He does draw a ton of attention. You know that. But I also think he's surrounded by, like you said about how teams may defend him or put like, he's also surrounded by guys that too can score. When he's playing mm-hmm. alongside Dennis Schroeder, who can score, or Cam Johnson, who can knock down an open three. All of these moving parts allow him, I think, still to have that type of potency. Um, and watching him and in particular that second half against Milwaukee, it was just special, but it also was one of those things where it's not surprising because we've seen him do it so many times before. And he's yeah. got the confidence, but I, he just, the growth of how he's reading things, reading a defense, and I too, I think you cannot say enough about how he really has bought into the idea that he knows he needs to get after on the defensive end to stay on the floor as much as he needs and wants to be on the floor. No, I think it's unquestionably been his best like stretch of defensive engagement. Um, and you've pointed that out on the broadcast. And I will give you another stat per uh, uh, my you know people I love at cleaning the glass very early. However, fifty percent of his shots last year were from three or at the rim. That number is up to two thirds so far. And does that match up with what you're seeing? Like, does that is that a number where you hear? Oh, he said that again. Fifty percent of his shots last year were at were either at the rim or from three. This year, that number is sixty-seven percent. So two thirds of yeah. his shots. 
One, I love that. And thank you for bringing that number because I think that does match the eye test and why mm -hmm. we've liked maybe even more what we've seen out of what he's done offensively. Because I think in some cases in the past, a lot of, or a lot more, I shouldn't say all of them, but mm -hmm. a lot of mid-range looks had, had come from isolation or had come from him getting to his spots. We, we see this in a player like Kevin Durant or Devin Booker, whoever, Chris mm -hmm. A lot of it will come off of thinking, I can take this guy, and you find your best look ends up being in the mid-range. I think how and where he's getting his shots have lended himself to some of those looks. Um, and I do think that's why you just feel, just by watching it, it feels cleaner. It feels yeah. super fluid um, in ways that are at an elevated rate. And so, yeah, that... That to me, I mean, I wouldn't have known the numbers, but that to me lines up, I think, with why we're like, oh, this aesthetically, this this feels even better right. uh, than what we've seen before. There was a play yesterday uh, where there was the end one against Gary Trent, like the scoop righty layup, where in the past, I know he gets that shoulder in a Gary Trent and like uses it to step back and like he can make it, you know what I mean? But he got the shoulder into him and kept going and drew the foul and extended. And I was, that was a play where you can actually see it. There was the up and under on Bobby Portis where he gets to two feet and instead of fading away, he pump fakes and steps through. And it's like, yeah, this Jordy talking about efficiency shot profile, you know, still a third of his shots are from the mid range. Like his game isn't going to completely change, but this so far looks to be the sort of, you know, mutually beneficial pairing that I think Nets fans like would have hoped would happen when Jordy started talking like this. And um, I also think like the two to three assists a game, I do think he's gotten a little unlucky with some of his teammates. Where like, he could have more. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And like the Claxton lob off the glass yesterday went down as a rebound. I don't think they've changed that, that yet. I, our, our Nets on Yes group chat is still blowing up about that. I ain't evolved our great producer Frank DeGrace, Ryan Rago. Yeah. Is there a debate? Well, no, just because it's 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 facts, what we have mm -hmm. learned. And also thanks to Aaron Harris, um, the wonderful um head of PR for yes. the Brooklyn Nets, is that in the Jason Kidd era and Eras Pass, which of course is where, you know, Ian was talking about and Rico and Frank, um, those used to be assists. But yep. the NBA has now changed. I think it's since twenty fourteen. Um, those are no longer assists. Because I don't know if you remember, remember when there was that absolutely just nasty break with Mike James, Durant. Yes. I don't know if Harden was involved. Who, no, Kyrie, who, or Kyrie was trailing. I don't know. Yeah, Mike James was, threw it, it off the glass. The and James threw it off the glass, uh, Mike James. And that was not, I think he was initially award assist and then the NBA um, really pushed it or took it back. Um, so no, so that is just a, it's just the way things are. Um, Ugh. but that was a beauty, that was a beauty, beauty of a play. Yeah. Um, and Claxton point at him down the court. You're like, ah, that is sickening that, that they did not. Anyway, but no, but you love to, that's what you love to see. Yeah. You love that awareness. Um, yeah, definitely. By him on the floor. And I think we've seen a lot, a lot of that. Yeah. For him, I think it's just going to be about like, kind of getting all like this coherent this single mindset where sometimes i feel like he oscillates into okay i'm getting a shot up and that's kind of something different but where when he's just playing and feeling and reading the game he's playing really well and this is the thing every young guard has to go through but for me that would be like the thing i'm continuing to look for from him you know can you play like that for 48 minutes um wow that is that is just about everything in terms of the real meaty stuff we got going on. Anything you want to add? Like any play, any stretch? I mean, I feel like we covered a lot of good stuff no, today. I think we, we, I think we hit it all. I think we hit it all. And as we said, I'm just excited to keep, keep watching it, see how it continues to progress and what it looks like. All right. This is another two-part trivia question to end. Have the Nets ever had a player average 30 points in a season? Are we talking ABA days or is this? Oh, wow. Days? We are. I, I will. I'm including it. I, that you already get a point for that because I was setting you up for a whole thing and then you saw right through me. So, yeah, we're including ABA. Okay. So the doctor, am I going with the doctor? 
No. no. Oh my gosh, Bernard King? No, no. I'm giving you a point. You, we, you can have another guess. You can have as many guesses as you want. It's well, I'm now not. I'm just thinking about who else from from the it's from the ABA champion that a player that was Bob a, Williams, a player. No, no, no. That predated the champion ABA Nets, a player that had a fairly. And it wasn't uh, Dr. J. It wasn't Dr. J. I don't want to say tumultuous, but a player that had a lot going on. Oh, you're gonna. Oh, you're gonna say a player it. that you know, like a player. I'm, it's not like it's a player you know. Just tell me. Rick Barry. Oh. I know. I know. You got you got you on the right track because you know you went with the ABA like man you, you, I knew I knew it had to be I didn't even I just forgot about Rick okay yeah people for I went to I was like on Wikipedia and like searching related articles for a long time last night no Rick got, like that's a good one that's a good that's that's good that's history I appreciate this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I appreciate bringing us back to the the ABA roots. Yeah, no, the uh, some great uniforms. I have a, uh, you know what, you know what bothered me. By the way, can I just say, mm, I, yeah, this is the platform I, I, of yours, the podcast I, of yours. So tell us. I promise I won't go on for too long. The whole oh, the Knicks, uh, it won in 1973, and when the New York Liberty won, it was the city's first pro basketball championship in 51 years. You were you were saying that they didn't acknowledge the ABA Nets. I'm like, okay, listen, if because I'm a New York Giants fan. If the New York Giants and the New York Jets get this whole thing, like I know the New York Nets played in Long Island, but like it was Dr. J. That's a New York City basketball championship. It's been 48 years, not 51. Like it just has it. Nobody would argue with that. I, I, I fully am behind you and support you. And like, I promise you to talk to. I'll go talk to. I promise that's not even like a, a Nets. Oh, this is a Nets podcast. Like that genuinely is annoying. It's just a, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm glad we agree. I'm with you. Do you count Thank the God. Minnesota Lakers championship? Do they? Is I that the same I thing? Count. It's different because it's an entirely different state, like a very far state. I mean, I would say like, oh, like if we're counting Minnesota basketball titles, I'd say, yeah, like the Minneapolis Lakers won those and they won, you know? However, if I'm hanging banners in crypto, yeah. on that note, that concludes episode two of The Backcourt with Lucas Kaplan and Sarah Kustak. What a great time we had. What a great week it's been for the Nets. If you enjoyed this podcast, you should leave us a review. Give us five stars, whatever Yes, it is. yes, please. Wherever you get your podcasts. I don't know, you know. Do the thing. We don't that... discriminate, but just stars. We we would love all the stars. You can give us reviews. a description if you want. And honest and honest reviews. Honest reviews. Hit me up, Twitter, whatever. I'll see it. If you have any suggestions, I'm sure we'll do a mailbag soon. Sarah, it's been great talking mm -hmm. with you. Any parting words? No, LK. Just can't wait to do it again next week. Well, hopefully, we're we're talking about more Nets, uh, solid play and wins next week me, when we do it. Me too. Five games this week. We'll see you guys for episode three. Thank you guys for listening.